85 years ago, in a remote corner of Tibet, a little boy was born to a poor farming family. One day, miraculously, he was discovered to be the reincarnation of the 13th Dalai Lama, and he was soon carried away to the capital city of Lhasa to become the next political and spiritual leader of the vast kingdom of Tibet. But the little boy had a secret locked inside his heart. Since my childhood, so I love technology. If I had not become a Dalai Lama, I would still remain in my native place. Then eventually, so I may be engineer or electrician. Since childhood, always the curiosity to develop something new things to see. I always develop the question, why, why, how, how, always happy. I think really introduced about technology is some small toy small machines. Then I play a few moments, and then out of my curiosity, I always open, dismantle. I think maybe 50-50 chance to reassemble. 50 fail. <laughs> and then actually, not much interest for study. I'm really, very, very lazy student. I always prefer play. One movie projector which belongs to the Dalai Lama. Because it's uh, quite old, so quite often you see breakdown. Small dynamo, reduce electricity. Then I began to realize AC, DC, how it works. So then gradually you see develop interest for science. Uh, I have a keen interest about cosmology. My telescope, I used to use this look to moon. Then I found some rock mountains. Western side, shadow there. East side, no shadow. Moon, uh, no light. But light only from sun. Clear. One full moon night. Uh, I arranged my telescope and I invited my tutor. Please look where the light comes from, the sun. So they, they seriously said, they watch and then agree. Yes, moon, no light. Light comes from sun. So then, 1954, when I was in Peking, China, we visit huge hydro electricity factory. I have a keen interest. And then you see asking some questions to those engineer or electrician, or electrician way. Oh, the differences of AC and DC and these things. And then also you see different sort of factories. I think I was the only person fully alert to see oh, what it work. The Communist Chinese Army entered Tibet in 1950, and despite the many months that the young Dalai Lama spent in high-level meetings in Beijing, when he returned to Lhasa, negotiations with Chinese government leaders soon began to fail, and tensions started to rise. In 1959, rumors of a Chinese government plot to kidnap the Dalai Lama caused 300,000 Tibetan people to surround the Dalai Lama's palace creating a human wall to protect him. The Dalai Lama was able to secretly leave in the middle of the night in a daring escape. Four days later, the Chinese army took action to disperse the crowd around the palace and fighting broke out in Lhasa. This fighting soon spread across Tibet and thousands died in the aftermath. 
Many Tibetan families escaped from Tibet to join the Dalai Lama in India, where Prime Minister Nehru had granted him land. At the age of 16, I lost my freedom. At the age of 24, I lost my own country. And yet, over time, he was able to create one of the most successful refugee communities in the world, run by a democratically elected Tibetan government in exile, with the rebuilding of the monasteries, now in India, and with the preservation of Tibet's unique Buddhist science, philosophy, spiritual traditions, language, and culture. Gradually, the Dalai Lama began to have opportunities to begin meeting with leading scientists. Uh, David Wong, Von Vesica, and some other great scientists. Uh, these people become my friend, and not only friend, but Von Vesica and David Wong, I consider my own teacher of, of physics generally in particular quantum physics. But science is always seen as measurement. Is that no longer true? Well, science is whatever people make of it. You see, science has changed over the ages, and it's different now from a few hundred years ago, and it could be different again. Now, there's no intrinsic reason why science must necessarily be measurement. This is a, another historical development which has come about over the past few centuries. It's entirely contingent and not absolutely necessary. And when Einstein produced his special theory, yeah. which the Times newspaper of London dismissed yeah. as being nonsense, um, was he moving towards wholeness? Yes, he definitely was. Uh, as, uh, he moved eventually toward a view of field theory where everything was one field, all the fields merging. So it was a step toward wholeness, although not, you know, it was a limited step, but still it was the beginning. David Baum and Carl von Weisacker explained that the great minds which created the current field of quantum physics at the turn of the century, Einstein, Bohr, and others, created their groundbreaking theories through thought experiments alone, not by carrying out experiments in the lab. Thought experiments, which were similar to those created by leading scholars in the various schools of Tibetan science. Uh, physics, uh, like quantum physics, very similar. The mathematical philosophy's view, nothing exists by objectively. Wonderful. After that visit, the Dalai Lama met with a new group of scientists. I met his own in 83 in an international conference. Immediately, the charm of his keen intelligence totally Unassuming, just pure interest. I was very touched by that. And we we're in the middle of this conversation. His assistants were pulling him by saying, Holland, let's go. And then he said, Why don't you come to the Ramsala and we can continue these discussions? It was in February of 1985 that a uh, phone rang on Francisco Varela calling from Paris. I understand that you're trying to put together a science meeting with the Dalai Lama. I was a friend of Francisco Varela's, and Adam Ingle came down to the Ojai Foundation and met with us. And we sat under this big oak tree, and we discussed connection between interests that Francisco and I had and what Adam and Michael Saltman wanted to do. And I remember really clearly, he said, Adam, he said, don't do physics, do cognitive science. It was a really good fit between Adam and Francisco. They had complementary skills, and so the whole thing began to unfold. It was very, very extraordinary to watch it. I mean, it happened. The most interesting things that happen in evolution, and therefore the most useful thing to explain the diversity of life, are internal factors rather than selective pressures. Yes, it is true that if the planet goes very cold, animals have to change. But how they change, how they go about it, is the result of internal factors, much more so than external factors. It is as if external factors impose very broad constraints, but do not, cannot possibly determine what will happen. And I find this very interesting because it's an exact parallel of what we saw in perception, that yes, we need light and we need some stimulation in the retina. Those are the constraints, but what we see depends on the internal factors and the two together 
give rise then to some kind of a stable perception. Well, here it seems to be much the same thing. The environment gives some kind of constraint, internal factors, then species and evolution. His explanation, very clear, I think very precise, very helpful. A person who have real authority in certain scientific field, at the same time, personally practicing Buddha Dharma, that's, I think, quite rare. So, you see, he can explain with a more fuller knowledge of both fields, science and Buddhist philosophy. So that's very useful, helpful, certainly. It was actually like a huge comet, <laughs> but of such dimension that the, just the collision evaporated the seas for the next, uh, what was it, I don't know, many uh, years, it was purely in terms of clouds. That meant that, you know, the dramatic impact of life, at that point, life virtually was abolished. Who stayed? As I mentioned yesterday, our little friends. <laughs> <laughs> they were untouched. <laughs> that was horrible. <laughs> we might wipe ourselves out of the planet with atomic bombs, and that probably wouldn't end life on the planet. So, in fact, from that point of view, you can reverse the tree and put the bacteria on top. They are the best. We are very so-so, because, in fact, we have made our environment so fragile. So the result, I mean, the serious discussion with scientists then it become clear. Uh, this kind of discussion with scientists is mutual benefit. And then after it was over, I looked at his holiness again and I said, well, you want to do it again? And he said, yes. On the day of the second meeting, we got a call from Oslo, Norway. The Dalai Lama had just won the Nobel Peace Prize. I will call on you as you raise your hand. We're open for questions. Why do you think you were chosen for this prize? And don't be humble. <laughs> I think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think last 30 years, uh, become a refugee. You see, desperate situation. Yet, I follow strictly my, with my own, how to say, according to my own principle. Nonviolence. I think that is, the, that is the main reason. Later on, I learned that some of his advisors had said, you have to cancel this science conference because this is a great opportunity. But he refused to do so. His commitment was to the scientists. Here he was. He had just won the Nobel Prize, and he was still perfectly present, calm, steady, impressive. The vast majority of scientists were skeptical. Now, when I first sat down with the Dalai Lama, it was actually quite surprising. See, I had the stereotyped vision of an Asian spiritual master as kind of floating on a cloud. They're going to be kind of transcendent, eyes half closed, occasionally saying perhaps inscrutable things. But here, I'm sitting down across from him. I had this feeling I was across from a wrestler, you know, intellectually. He was taking my ideas and he was grabbing them and testing them. Now, I would like to show experimental evidence for the atom. Are there techniques like a microscope or some technique which will allow us to see even a single atom? Now, until very recently, this was impossible. But within the last 10 to 15 years, we now have very interesting evidence. There's a laser which comes in, shines on the atom, illuminates the atom, <laughs> and then the light is given off, and we can see it. You see a tiny, tiny pinpoint of light from this single atom. So this looks... It is through the telescope. No, telescope. It is, it's with naked, naked eye. eye. Naked eye. Naked eye. Naked eye. Naked eye. 
It's so bright. It's so bright. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very small, mm -hmm. but it's extremely bright. And it doesn't move. It's no, it's localized in a very small region. It's and very, it. very small region. It's high on track. He would ask something and then throw something back at me and back and forth. He's like this. He's got his arms a little bit outside. And he's going, hmm, hmm. So, isn't it the case that the atoms are always in a constant dynamic flux? You can ask, is it possible when one comes to an absolute zero temperature and you can go no further, are the atoms completely still? Classically, the answer would be yes, in classical physics. In quantum mechanics, it turns out the answer is no. Because quantum mechanically, the atoms must always have a small motion. This is, no. yeah? mm -hmm. this is an experimental fact now. You can watch the motion decrease until you reach a threshold and then it flattens out and the motion continues at that level no matter how cold you go. But the but how the big bang is there, isn't it? Quite a bunch of water, right? The big bang is going to be too much of a touch. That's in terms of the day. I don't know if you want to go to the space part of the job, but I don't know if you want to go to the space part of the job. I don't know if um, in terms of the Big Bang, does there needs to be something to kind of ignite the Big Bang. If it really is a bang of sorts, then there need, it needs to be something that, that ignites that Big Bang. But if prior to the Big Bang, there is, it is absolutely cold, then how could there be any, any ignition? How could there be anything to a catalyze it? I expected somebody that was kind of disconnected from reality and in a spiritual fog. What I found was a person completely present, surprising. Since over 30 years, uh, we developed serious discussion with uh, many scientists, mainly from America, five fields, cosmology, quantum physics, psychology, neuroscience, then biology. The dialogues focused in detail on cosmology. George Greenstein is a colleague of mine at Amherst College. When thinking about the origin of the universe, we have a lot of facts that we know, but they lead us to a gigantic question. We do not know how to deal with all matter occupying exactly the same space. And we also do not know how to deal with all matter having infinite energy. Was the Big Bang creation, or was it simply a stage in the evolution of the universe? Did the universe exist prior to the Big Bang and pass through this state and then come into the current state, or was the universe created at that instant? So what do you mean by creation? I mean, as a, as prior a... to the Big Bang, there was nothing, yeah. and after the Big Bang, there was a lot. But you do what you have creation is So would you say something that is caused event is a creation? If you say that the universe is, comes from a cause, would that be considered <laughs> a creation? Nice. I want to ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> a third possibility. The universe existed, contracted to a bounce, expanded, stopped, contracted to another bounce, and this way, endlessly. An endless series of cycles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Beginless. No. so to relate this story you, you know, that you told of the different options that speculations that physicists have come up with, um, the Buddhist um, position seems to be much closer to the third option, where there is this constant expansion and shrinking and, and then coming into being again, this repeated dissolution and the origination of the universe. One thing that we need to bear in mind is that this idea in a repeated kind of dissolution and origination of the universe does not necessarily suggest that, you know, the same kind of universe will come into existence over and over again. Same elements all the time. Uh, and same also, elements, all the time. Um, kind of 
سعر وسعر في elements as well اه دي من بدري موسس so you you can envision uh, a new universe with a whole set of new properties and elements that may not you know, be the same as the one that existed before and here of course from the buddhist point of view karma has has a role to play one thing i would like to mention however is that the idea of our planet being the center of the universe this anthropocentric was never in the picture from the from the sutras they speak from the beginning of billion fold universe ours being a small unit a thousand of those being a secondary unit a thousand of those secondary unit being a tertiary unit that means <coughs> billion fold universe they speak of universe being like curtains of lights like uh, uh, horses spouting fires wheels of light all these beautiful images that you seems to be already looking in the hubble telescope but still the idea that there was almost infinite possibilities universes and of a big inness also as another thing there must have been life there must have been consciousness in all those billion universe so in a way our big bang is a very very small part of history from that perspective tatrisha So his holiness says that he has 100% um, support for Matthew when he contrasts the problems, the concept, the imagination problem versus the logical problem Virginia. with respect to beginning and beginninglessness. So the idea that um, we can imagine, it's easier for imagination when we say there is a beginning, but logically we have more problem. But it's harder to imagine when you say it's beginningless, but logically that seems to be more in tune with mm. reason. the knowledge about cosmology big bang these things in principle the buddhist sort of cosmology explanation uh, quite quite similar The dialogues also focused on quantum physics. What you see here is a little laser which emits light. These particles go in one after the other, one after the other. Okay. Oh. There is a contradiction here. On the one hand, we have individual particles which can go through one slit only at a time. On the other hand, we have the stripes which indicate that there are waves which go through both slits. How can something go through one slit and to both slits at the same time? This is now a very important point, which is new in, in modern physics, is that the observer, experimentalist decides which of the two features, particle or wave, is reality. So the observer has a very strong influence on nature. There is no reason why in this run of the experiment you get this result. And this is really the first time in physics that we see something like that. That we see events for which we cannot build a chain of reasoning. Uh, some people even said that what we observe in the, in, in the individual quantum event is a spontaneous act of creation. So, with this, I think I have finished my exposition of the quantum physics of individual particles. And as the next one, I would like to go to the quantum physics of two or more particles, which also has its own deep, deep uh, uh, mysteries for us. The, the notion which we use to describe connectedness of two particles, the name is entanglement. So the idea is that these two particles, even if they are separated over a very large distance, mm -hmm. they always remain one system. They are not really separated. So when we're talking about dependency here, the fact that what happens here on one side seems to be dependent on what happens on the other side. We're not talking in terms of causal dependence, are we? Mm. 
That is a very deep question. Uh, a little illustration. Suppose you have two dice, and then at some time you throw a die and your friend throw a die. And it turns out that even as both of them are completely random, they always give the same number. How can that be? So the idea is that these two particles, even if they are separated over a very large distance, they are always they always uh, uh, remain one system. They are not really separated in a deep sense. That is a whole universe that is So it's. So you, are you implying that the entire universe is is internally entangled? Well, that is a nice idea, but I would I would not want to take a position on that because as an experimentalist, I would not know how to prove that. <laughs> <laughs> mm. That is it. Prove it. Prove it. Prove it. that probably someone who can prove it will have to be able to live very long to see the whole. <laughs> <laughs> they continued to meet. You might ask whether everything is the same or whether something has changed in quantum physics. And there are actually two important changes. One change concerns a technical thing happening. And I know that your holiness, you love technology. <laughs> so I will mention that. Uh, uh, and that is the fact that based on these fundamental questions which we discussed already, uh, people are developing a new technology for, inf for information. And that is really a big surprise. Now, this is a picture which tries to indicate the entanglement of many qubits. Each blue point is supposedly to be a qubit and you have many connections here. Now, if I measure one qubit, then it changes the whole state. It does not only change the one I look at, it changes all the other ones. Then I measure another one, another qubit, and that changes the rest. And I keep going. And if I keep going the right way, in the end, I have the solution I want. This is a completely new way of, of thinking about computation. It's different from any, any computation people have been talking about. So right. in a sense, it's the first technical application of wholeness. Uh, I think this time the subject is very, very important. Mm. In any case, you see, those subjects which often you see create more confusion, that itself is showing more complicated. <laughs> so really worthwhile, you see, the, Further discussion, uh, and I think discussion between uh, the scientists, uh, those specialists in this, in this particular in this field, field, and Buddhists. Uh, I prefer young scholars. They are um, your team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my team, my team, yes. <laughs> now, the second point which happened, which was actually in part encouraged if not inspired by our earlier discussion, is some new ideas which, are, which we are developing on the conceptual foundations of quantum mechanics. We are simply asking, maybe knowing, maybe knowledge is as fundamental or maybe even more fundamental than reality. We can very well handle this kind of paradoxical situations we have been talking about mathematically and we can confirm them in experiment with very high precision but we still do not know conceptually what is going on why is the world so strange and what I want to see someday before I pass away that someone explains to me why it is so strange <laughs> <laughs> so I want to so I want to learn new concepts, and, and this is a place, and there were some new concepts brought out in, in your discussion, which are very interesting for me, and where I have to think more, and where I hope I, I learn something which might even be, have relevance in, in, in helping to understand some of these phenomena in physics. 
So here I will insist on the critique of the idea of intrinsic existence and of the idea that they have intrinsic properties. So to begin with, science made a momentous step forward mm -hmm. as soon as it understood that certain explanations have to be given in terms of relations rather than in terms of absolute properties. First example, the Schrodinger cat. You have a box, and inside the box, the bottle contains poison. You have a big piece of radioactive material that has the probability one half to disintegrate. The state of the piece of radioactive material is in a superposition between being disintegrated and not being disintegrated. And according to quantum mechanics, the cat should be half dead and half alive. But this, is, this sounds absurd, because when you open the box and see in the box, it's not the case. You see either a, a dead cat or a, a cat which is alive. So there is a paradox. Can I just say, maybe we should add that there is no cruelty involved here, yeah. because this is a thought experiment. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you, John. Yes, this is perfectly right. And I must say, I've personally gone to Schrodinger's house. I've seen in, in his house that he had many cats. And so he loved cats. In fact. <laughs> so he Hopefully loved. not experimented. Yes, unfortunately it's a thought experiment. Yes, yes. Experiment, experimenting on cats? <laughs> never, never. Perhaps you remember, we had met six years ago at Stanford, and we had a discussion with a few other people for morning and lunch, and that was a very important event in my life. And since coming here, I've learned a great deal. I hope to start by addressing this question about the nature of matter and the nature of life. Now, the single most important thing we know is that the world is made of atoms. This is a picture of iron atoms put on a surface of a piece of metal. Each of these little bumps is one atom. You have to get it very, very cold for them to stay. <laughs> so maybe it's too cold to move. <laughs> Frozen. <laughs> Atoms are made of other particles, such as electrons around the outside. This is very strange. Our current understanding of these particles is they have no size. Infinitely small. And we describe the particle in terms of these field lines, these fields. If the atom were the size of the Earth, the size of this electron would be smaller than one millimeter. <laughs> so we know it, it must be smaller than that. Now, how do we know that? We actually take electrons and we throw them at another electron and if the electron had size, these particles of electrons would bounce from them differently than if the electron was just a point. And we can mathematically predict which is which, and what we see, no size, just point. Whether there's anything that is, do they provide any kind of obstruction to an incoming entity? And my impression from what you just said is, Yes, and, the, and they, that is you can collide to electrons, but they collide as if they were pure points rather than having any type That's of spatial right. dimensionality. You're absolutely correct. When we speak of simply the existence of things in our, in our shared world, we posit the existence of things. What is actually the nature of the electron itself and independently of, of its own parts, that type of ontological analysis, you don't find it. So then you're left with a couple of options. Again, you can either say, well, these elementary particles and so forth, every, all these things that we identify, they do things. So to say, as they're doing things and things are done to them that they don't exist, is foolishness. Every property that I know of, it depends. So when we say the electron has these intrinsic properties, we don't say it, it has an intrinsic property. We're not going to talk about the electron as a, as a being. It also includes the interaction. 
we have to include the interaction. Because that's the observation. Because in order to even observe the electron, we need some interaction. So in that respect, I don't think it conflicts with the Buddhist philosophy. All the others are a matter of the observation. It has, which means it intimately is connected with the rest of the world. I don't see a conflict, quite frankly. <laughs>
So the more we have the negative image of the person, the more we're going to attack him, but it's always the image that we're having that is bothering us, not the real person. So we talked about delusion before, in a way. Yes. A lot of hatred is based on a delusion, but it's also between countries, nations, ethnic groups. They tend to have kind of an image, a mental image yes. of the other people as some way subhuman. Let's say when the Germans would have pictures of the Russians during World War II, they'd show the Russians as uh, looking like beasts, wild beasts. Then, of course, the people thought it's okay to shoot wild beasts mm. because they're not human beings anymore. So I think the similar, the Buddhist concept, all these negative emotions based on ignorance or misconception. Holiness, just apart for one moment, you mentioned about the broad perspective before, and I think much of the unhappiness that individuals have is because they lose perspective. And I thought I'd give you an example. There was uh, some time ago, I was asked to consult about a professor of physics. And he thought that he had made a very great discovery, which might give him the Nobel Prize. And uh, he got passed over. He did not get the Nobel Prize. And so he was depressed. And so I said, well, how important part of your life was this prize? And he said, 100%. So I asked him, I said, do you have a family? And he said, oh, yes. And I said, well, how important is your family to you? So he said, my wife, 20%. And I said, do you have children? And he said, yes, I have three children. And I said, how important are they to you? And he said, oh, I guess they're about 40%. And I said, do you get to see your children very much? He said, well, no, I've had so much time working on my physics project that I, I really haven't spent much time with them. And I, I said, how do you feel about that? And, and then he started to weep. And I uh, said, why are you weeping? He says, it reminded me when I was growing up, that's just the way my father was to me. And he said, now I suddenly realize what I am missing out on. My father missed out on it. I'm missing out. And of course, my children are missing out. So I said, now how important are your children to you now? And he said, 80%. Uh, Anyhow, he left the office uh, and he wasn't depressed anymore. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, very wise, wise, I think right method, right method. Uh, that we call exactly analytical meditation. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, sometimes I express the compare ancient Indian psychology, particularly Buddhist psychology. Modern psychology looks like a kindergarten level. <laughs> well, I'm a secularist. The only reason I met the Dalai Lama was because of my daughter. And I knew that if you got invited to his palace in Dharamsala, you got to bring a single observer. And I thought, what a kick this would be for my daughter. And so although I thought this was just another one of the Bay Area fads, I figured, okay, I'll make an exception, I'll go. We start with Paul Ekman, professor of psychology and director of the Laboratory for Human Interaction uh, at the University of California Medical School in San Francisco. But what you really should know about him is that he is a master of the face and of emotions and of reading emotions. And he has more than 30 years of world-class research. For inexplicable reasons, he and I really connected. I felt like I'd known him all my life. And that the function of emotion is to get us moving, active, very quickly, without having to think. But many, many, most of the things we become emotional about are things we have learned in the course of growing up. And the issue, which I will get to later, is can we unlearn some of them? So what I've been doing is trying to distinguish 
many different important states. The emotions, the moods, resentment, hatred. One of the reasons why we have so much difficulty once we become emotional is that the emotion itself enslaves us. There is what I would like to call a refractory period. That is a period in which new information doesn't enter. Or if it enters, it is interpretation is biased. That refractory period may be only a few seconds, or it may be much longer. As long as it's occurring, we can't get out of the grip of that emotion. I want to say that after um, spending more than 35 years studying emotion, I'm impressed about how little we still know about it. When we met and tried to think, what do we mean by destructive emotions, we came up with the definition, emotions that harm self or others. Mm -hmm. Your definition is extremely subtle. Your definition of destructive emotions is what disturbs the calm of the mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Buddhist. Uh, my ultimate goal is Buddhahood. This is my business. <laughs> <laughs> and how can we educate our emotions, by what means, without becoming Buddhists? <laughs> so therefore, there's a possibility here that even though the grasping at the intrinsic reality of self or whatever it is, the object, has arisen, uh, one could prolong the cause of sort of in a process between that instance of grasping and the actual arisal of the affliction. So, in terms of really a precise, a precise analysis, what takes place, let's say, in the first instant of apprehending a flower, the very first instant you simply apprehend the flower without verification, you're simply apprehending the flower itself. In the next instant, that, that is a valid cognition. But normally speaking, in the second instant, then there's a reification of the flower, and as soon as that reification of the flower takes place, then you're into a false cognition. And so as Holiness concludes here, it is to be seen whether you can find the precise neural correlate uh, of the mere apprehension of the flower versus the very next instant of the reification of the flower. And so it would, be, it would be very interesting to see whether by studying the brain you will be able to, to, to discern the difference between a valid cognition and an invalid cognition. In addition, the dialogues focused on the field of neuroscience. Neurobiology, oh, wonderful. I think if we properly sort of study this and uh, get some knowledge, I think it can serve seven billion human beings. The Dalai Lama invited me to come meet with him because he was interested in catalyzing serious neuroscientific research on the mind and brains of Tibetan practitioners that spent years cultivating their minds. And in fact, on that momentous day in 1992, he was quite stern in a way. And he challenged me and he said, you've been using the tools of modern neuroscience to investigate depression and anxiety and stress and fear. Why can't you use those same tools to study kindness and compassion? And for me, it was a wake up call. I didn't have a very good answer other than that it's hard. Scientific collaboration and research began in earnest, even though neuroscientist Francisco Varela became seriously ill. And a conference on neuroscience was organized in the year of 2000 for the presentation of their results. I wanted to tell you, you know, Francisco got very ill in 1997 with the cancer, and then after that, he had to make the decision to have the transplantation of the liver. He had to decide to die or to live. 
and at that time he was thinking that he did not want to do the transplant. Then he received a fax from you where you said, you must do everything to get healthy and keep working and practicing and doing science. And he said, this is a message to me to make the right decision, to live. And he made the right decision, thanks to you. afternoon or now, what I'd like to turn to is the theme of the meeting on destructive emotions uh, and talk about some antidotes to destructive emotions and how we can think about those antidotes in neuroscientific terms. And one question which um, we have pursued, whether meditation will have effects in a long-term way on this area of the brain. A more formal experiment that we have recently completed uh, with John Kabat-Zinn, who presented to Your Holiness uh, at a previous Mind and Life meeting. John Kabat-Zinn has been developing methods to use mindfulness meditation in a large variety of populations, including medical patients, employees in the workplace. He conducted the training himself. We wanted to explore the extent to which these factors uh, of brain activity can be changed in normal lay people. The logic in this experiment was to see whether antidotes to stress, meditation, can have a beneficial effect on the immune system. So at the end of the study, the participants got the vaccine. The finding that we are actually uh, the most um, excited about because it's so unusual and it has never been demonstrated before, and that is when we vaccinated them with the influenza vaccine, um, we actually find that the meditation group shows a stronger response to the influenza vaccine compared to the control group. We will be repeating this study with measures using MRI, which allow us to look deep within the brain so that we can actually look at the amygdala. We are energized with vigor and zeal to <laughs> pursue this in the future, and we hope to continue this kind of collaboration. Um. Your Holiness, like my colleagues before, um, just a little, uh, a little thought before we begin. Um, it seems to me truly wondrous that I'm here again with you once more. We have done experiments with audition, with memory, with conflict of attention between visual and auditory. The answer is always the same. The transitoriness of mental factors is like they come and they go. And what we have here is a correlate in this green stuff. That was, the, for me, the big discovery, that the brain actively undoes itself. So it creates like gaps uh, where, you know, the transition from one moment to the next is actually marked. So you have recognition and then action, but they are punctuated. It's like, you know, saying uh, perception, comma, action. <laughs> you don't just put them in a flow, in a continuum. This is, again, what we were talking about the other day, that time lasts a little bit. And in fact, it lasts here. You can see the first moment of time of the recognition is about a third of a second. Then another same similar moment when you do an action, which is pushing the button. And this is systematic. We have seen this in all kinds of different conditions. Okay. Right. give it to you. Do you know what you have? Give it to me. You know? Ah, I'm not going to. I'm going to. You must talk one. 
Yes. So I'm going to just to see whether you agree that this corroborates a point of Buddhist psychology. Well, don't get into more. Is there another question? <laughs> um, and that is, in the first moment, is a purely visual perception, which is non-conceptual. In the second moment, uh, whatever that moment, whatever the duration of that moment happens to be, then the conceptual mind apprehends this is this. Absolutely. You cannot compress a moment beyond typically normal conditions, 150 milliseconds. Even if it's something almost immediate, it's about 150 milliseconds. This moment of arising is another whoop. <laughs> <laughs> so the brain works by these hoops, and whatever it is, whether it is visual perception of the field, whether it is uh, the close your eyes and you have a mental image, it's the same thing. Then to con really conclude, Your Holiness, my point is that this was done with somebody who is not really highly trained. But we, now what we want to do is to take highly trained people, like meditators, who can actually go into much more fine detail what was the moment of experience. And for example, we want to work with the monasteries in Dordogne, in the south of France, and in May, for example, we hope to have Matthew come to the lab and do these kinds of experiments. So if we can find differences, even with ordinary people, then with more expert people, we should be able to really go into much finer detail. So with that thought, I wanted to conclude because this is where, to me, there is a true possibility of collaboration, not just in principle, but in a very concrete sense. Thank you very much, Your Holiness. Francisco Varela, Richard Davidson, and others invited scientifically trained Mathieu Ricard, who had received a PhD in molecular genetics before he became a monk, to help them craft the experimental design. All these, all the scientific sort of, uh, the research work, oh, wonderful. Now you bring into the laboratory somebody like Matthew, complete stable mind, no distractions, no thoughts. So when the stimulus comes, he's always ready. And the results are completely different. Meditators who are experienced, the masters of precisely being able to become aware of what happens in the mind. And these first person methods are a radical departure from classical science. One is disembodied, impersonal. The other one is fully embodied totally situated. So here we have an occasion to really bring very much into the hardcore of research in science that idea. Why? Because this is interesting for science, the question of how to study consciousness. Both of them can give us knowledge. In both of them, you can have good science. They found this is certain uh, sort of knowledge, wonderful. It's not just speculation, but they actually, you see, found through, approved through experiment. This is an image of her brain, if we split the brain in half like mm -hmm. that. Um, now, we are going to do a demonstration for you, Tomorrow. Your Holiness. So you can, no chance. you can see, actually, that the areas are much more extensive. Mm -hmm during mental activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So the you know, you to Well, actually, mm -hmm. in, in dreaming, mm -hmm. uh, the brain is very active. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has been yeah. studied with these techniques. Uh, and there is activation in all of the sensory areas. So uh, mm -hmm. actually, that's very true. Yeah. <laughs> 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 With the MRI, we get spatial resolution, so very fine spatial resolution. With the EEG, we get uh, time resolution, things that are very fast. With this, we're, we're after chemical resolution and chemical selectivity. Um, that's the real advantage of using this particular imaging versus something else. We can be very selective about, about the chemistry that we look at. Then the instrument itself, also wonderful. Very sophisticated. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Must be very expensive. <laughs> Unexpectedly, just months before they were to meet again in person, Francisco Varela's health failed him for the final time. He lost his long struggle with liver cancer. He became terminally ill. 
our last conversation not face to face but through modern technology through video from matson to paris in that that's very moving good morning my uh, dear friend and in some sense i also consider you as a spiritual brother i was with francisco when the dalai lama called he could no longer move he could no longer talk but he was watching so strongly the screen with the dalai lama speaking to him that i thought he was going to dive into the screen as if it were a swimming pool he was in the screen with him and it was a very very moving moment for everyone who was there so i wanted to express my uh as a day deep feeling to you as a human brother and your contribution in science in in the science i think you made especially in the uh neurology you made great sort of contribution and then also in our work some kind of dialogue between science and with the citing science of mind and also some other field i think you made great contribution so we never forget that till my death i will remember you one year later francisco's wife and son met with the dalai lama in remembrance how old are you 10 10 So before you come to this world I already know your father. <laughs> so great, really great. The Dalai Lama told me that he always has this photo of Francisco with him and that he takes it with him whenever he travels, wherever he goes to this day still. And then the Dalai Lama reaffirmed his personal commitment to driving forward the collaboration between Buddhist science and Western science in the years ahead. In 2003, the Dalai Lama opened up his conversations with scientists to the public with a groundbreaking conference at one of the most prestigious scientific research universities in the world. MIT In 1998 we added collaborative research to our mission. And by that what we had in mind was a true collaboration between Buddhism and science where scientists and Buddhists would stand shoulder to shoulder and design the scientific protocols, recruit the subjects, execute the research, analyze the results together and publish together. All of our public meetings have been co-sponsored by major research universities starting with MIT and then with Georgetown, Johns Hopkins Medical Institute, Emory, the Mayo Clinic, University of Zurich that really has gotten credibility and acceptance. We are going to explain a few um things about how mental imagery is being used as part of a an effort of personal transformation. We'll be talking about introspection and mechanism and mental imagery, and let me start off by pointing out that I have to be extremely humble. Um, that was a fantastic talk we just heard, and it reminded me of how little we know in the scientific community, just how narrow and focused we've been. Hopefully, we're starting to build a brick that can contribute to the wall, but we really must be modest. So that preface. Um, let me talk about what we've discovered. The Dalai Lama spoke before an overflow crowd of 14,000 at the annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience, despite a petition started by some Chinese neuroscientists to ban him from speaking. And in 2014, the Dalai Lama was invited to speak at one of the world's foremost medical research centers, the National Institute of Health. 
where he was greeted with a standing ovation. I don't think I can recall ever seeing this auditorium this full. <laughs> and I've been at NIH for 20 years. <laughs> so that says something about the person who is sitting to my left, who I think all of you want to hear from, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. His Holiness saw a demonstration just a few minutes ago of a 13-year-old girl with cerebral palsy who is in our rehabilitation lab with some very high-tech analyses of how her motor problems connect with what's going on in the brain and how training uh, on the elliptical and some other things they're doing is improving her legs functioning and maybe reprogramming the motor part of her brain. The controller is here. So controller damage and then this movement difficult. So now I learned training here change controller. Ultimately, scientific research should bring some benefit to humanity. The company or concerned people who made this, I really very much appreciate. Uh, and you now, you see, can, uh, can tell them how useful this, and then in, uh, I think, Europe, I think comparatively better, better facility. But look, Africa. Yeah. Many poor people. Uh, and then less developed country. Oh, suffering. Uh, immense. And then during 21st century, the scientists, technologists really developed a wonderful sort of invention. So you can see you can touch. Little cool hand. That's this device here. You see how the bag is now? Yes. And but that's paper. And it worked. Great sort of result Thank out of the scientific research and technology also. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. The Dalai Lama collected a prestigious award today for his unique contribution in engaging with multiple dimensions of science. The John Templeton Foundation stated that, for decades, the Dalai Lama has focused on the connections between the investigative traditions of science and Buddhism, specifically by encouraging scientific reviews of the power of compassion and its potential to address the world's fundamental problems. The Templeton Award, which was established over 40 years ago, claims to be the world's largest yearly monetary award. The Dalai Lama says that he intends to donate it to help impoverished children in India and also to fund further scientific research and investigation. The Dalai Lama continued to collaborate with many scientists, including Richard Davidson. If it weren't for these dialogues, I think I wouldn't have found some key insights. It's been deeply important and meaningful, and I think that it will transform science. Neuroplasticity simply means that the brain changes in response to experience and in response to training. Most of the time, the brain is changing unwittingly. Recent evidence suggests that the average American adult spends 47% of her or his waking life not paying attention to what they're doing. Now what you see here is the expression of high amplitude gamma oscillations. These gamma oscillations, when they are seen in normal human beings, are typically very brief, less than one second in duration. But we observe them continuously at high amplitude in these long-term meditation practitioners. These are oscillations which are associated with states of focused attention, as well as periods of insight when different elements of a percept or an idea come together in a kind of momentary insight. Then you see a burst of gamma. Now, this is very interesting. We have, for the very first time, a technology which allows us to actually look at epigenetic changes in human brain tissue. We can take a blood cell and we can convert that cell into a pluripotent stem cell. We can then turn it into any other kind of cell in the body. And one of the things that we can do in a dish is that we can turn it into any kind of neuron that we find in the human brain. And then we can look at gene expression in that neuronal stage. 
And so this is going to usher in a whole new era of investigation that enables us to look with much greater specificity at the brain than ever before. It is also important to know that there are three major periods of increased plasticity in the brain. One is right around birth. The second is around the onset of schooling between the ages of five and seven years. And the third is around adolescence. These are periods where the brain is radically reorganized, and these are all opportunities for intervention. The Dalai Lama also worked closely for many years with other scientists, like Paul Ekman. In 2016, they launched their comprehensive map of human emotions. If I heard you correctly, Your Holiness, oh, oh. you are talking about a map of emotions. Yes. Yes. We human beings, this marvelous intelligence, either, you see, become source of happiness or source of worry. You have all the facilities but at the same time, can be very, very unhappy person. We met every week for almost two years, trying to figure out how can we use graphics to give us insight into our emotions? How can we map them? The process of creating the map, of answering the questions that he kept raising about how to do it, how it should be shown, made me think about emotions in a way I hadn't thought of up until then, after 50 years of studying emotion, because of emotions, we may starve ourselves to death. Because of emotions, we may take our own life. But the fundamental drives are puny compared to the power of emotions which override them. They are what drives life. We must utilize a deeper level of our ability to think, to tackle, our emotions. The scientific dialogues continued, and they covered molecular biology and genetics. What I'm going to talk about essentially is how parents alter the activity of genes in the brain and how that influences the way their children respond to stress. And in particular, what I'd like to talk about and that component that may be somewhat new is how it is that the influence of parents can persist potentially over the entire lifespan. The idea is that, as I mentioned, parental care alters the activity of genes in the brain and that these effects are very specific. And the second component of this, these parental effects actually involve a form of plasticity. But this plasticity is different. It doesn't involve connections between neurons. The modifications actually occur at the level of the gene itself, and that there is an organization of the chemical environment in which the gene operates, and that is the effect that then sustains itself over the lifespan. They began to collaborate. And what was so impressive, I think, was the overlay between Buddhist philosophy and cognitive behavioral therapy. And what I wanted to do was to try to bring that into a particular context. What we're understanding is that many forms of illness and disease is shaped first by events that occur early in life, and second, it is shaped by various forms of family experience. And I'd like yourself and members of the audience to simply imagine life as a child growing up in a family with drug abuse, unemployment, financial stress, and physical and sexual abuse. And emotionally, they then become people who are very sensitive to threat. For these children, their anger is not wrong. It is very adaptive. We've created an environment in which the child must normally be angry. And one of the problems that we face in medicine, and particularly in psychiatry, is how do we reach out to those children? How do we deal with that form of anger? <laughs> Of course, uh, you know, related to this is 
a question which Solonis was saying that he has been often asking and interested that uh, as a result of brain changes at the brain level, there is a manifestation of changes at the psychological and emotional level. Yes, that's, that's uncontentious. But can one also imagine the reversal process where as a result of a thought process, change in the thought process, one could see a change on the brain, brain level as well. The optimism here is that these can occur and that the dialogue involved in cognitive behavioral therapy or in Buddhist philosophy can, there is the prospect of changing at the level of the gene itself. There is the prospect. I think a lot of our problem, not necessarily created by technology itself, but anger, hatred, fear. I had the honor to spend a week in Dharmashala at the invitation of His Holiness for a remarkable meeting, The Nature of Life, and it was a truly remarkable experience. It was a discussion we were having to do about embryonic stem cells. And it was offered from the Buddhist perspective that the Abhidharma mentions that through the meeting of two regenerative substances of the mother and the father, consciousness enters and the being then becomes sentient from which you might reason that the being becomes a sentient immediately at fertilization and that there would therefore be very serious problems with working with such a cell. And that was the opening position, the opening thought. And as more scientific discussion went back and forth about this point, it emerged that yes, but if you took embryos and separated the cells, you got two people, not one. And if you implanted an embryo, there was no guarantee that you would even get a single person. You might get none, because most embryos spontaneously abort. And so maybe it wasn't so simple. And maybe, in fact, and it was a, just a remarkable moment for me as a scientist hearing the Buddhists and His Holiness discussing this, maybe, in fact, there was a different interpretation there, and maybe there was no negative karma associated with experimentation at that point. I think our knowledge about consciousness, time goes, I think time passes, I think it will increase. This is my feeling. Right now in the West, people are trying to write about the ethical questions in genetics. And I hope that the monks here and yourself don't feel like you have to wait. I know several of the monks have said, well, I have so much to learn and so much to learn. You also have so much to teach. Still, a lot of things to further develop. So combination or discussion, you see, help to extend knowledge. And field of scientific research also now can, can expand. The Dalai Lama supported opening the field of contemplative neuroscience to a new generation. I'm a neuroscientist, and I did my PhD in postdoctoral work at Emory University. And they suggested that I go to the Summer Research Institute. And then following on that, I was able to get a grant to do a research study, a neuroimaging study on meditation. And so that really launched my career into a different direction. The Summer Research Institute is really instrumental in this whole field. They bring in a lot of the senior researchers and scholars and a lot of the younger graduate students and postdocs that are coming up. And the idea is to really foster our development. Young scientists who attend the Summer Research Institute are eligible to apply for a $20,000 Varela grant. More than 63 million in follow-on grant research funding in the field of contemplative neuroscience has been raised as a result. If you put out a request for papers to a conference, who should be allowed to speak? You know, if you're a young person and you're just getting your feet wet, you may actually be making a fool of yourself <laughs> when you get up and give your poster paper or your, your presentation. But actually, that's part of growing into the field. There's a nurturing that you can do of a community through inclusion in a conference. 
Amishi's lab was awarded a Varela grant in 2006. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. All right. You see my face? Okay. The Dalai Lama's intervention allows me to take very seriously the wisdom that comes from the Buddhist texts. Even in the conversation I had with him directly during this meeting, it was clear that this terrain he knows well. And in some sense, my results were so familiar to him that he almost thought they were obvious. That's sort of shocking because it's taken us about 70 years of attention research in the field of cognitive neuroscience to really come to a clear answer to some of these questions. And to him, it was what he predicted and it's what he was happy to see, but wasn't surprised by it. It's, it's definitely helped me uh, feel like I have a whole other gold mine of thought to lean on for motivating hypotheses in our studies. So Buddha himself, you see, made clear, oh, my follower, monks, scholars, should not accept my teaching out of faith, but rather thorough investigation and experiment. But today we have the great privilege of exploring what is one of the greatest mysteries of all, the nature of consciousness, the nature of the mind. Professor Christoph Koch, who's a professor of biology and engineering at Caltech. He is also the chief scientist at the Paul Allen Institute for Brain Science, a remarkable new initiative. Your Holiness, I have the great responsibility of representing 2,300 years of um, Western thought on this in one hour. This tradition reaches back all the way to the, to the Greeks in, in Western thoughts. Um, it's this tradition of that stresses the empirical querying of nature. You can think about things, but ultimately you have to test them against reality. And your theories, including theories of consciousness, have to be testable. Otherwise, they're not scientific uh, theories. When I spent a week with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I was struck by how often he talked about the need to reduce the suffering of all conscious creatures, and not just all people. That highly organized matter, such as my brain, such as your brain, such as the brains of other creatures, comes with conscious experience. I was struck by particular types of meditation. You can have what Buddhists call a naked awareness, pure experience, sheer experience. When you're conscious, so you're not asleep, you're conscious, but there's no content, there's no desire, no dream, no, uh, no fear, no ego, no, no sensory messages, but you're still conscious. Pure consciousness, very interesting. More and more, there was strong and growing support for the concept of allowing young Buddhist scholars who had mastered these techniques of controlling their own minds to also be trained as scientists themselves. I think now, at more than 10 years, we start selected monk student and special sort of class for science. I will just make a brief outline how we are overseeing many of the science initiatives that are taking place due to the guidance of His Holiness. The Science for the Monks is an initiative since year 2001 that was followed by the Sagar Science Leadership. Uh, the leadership program came into being because we felt that it's important not only to give the basic science education, but also to create a network of uh, science teachers or others who do the field work in different monasteries. Many science teachers, they very much impressed. These monk students do not know English, they do not know math, mathematics, but their way to thinking, to analyze, is very sharp. In 2006, when Your Holiness invited us to collaborate with the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives to develop this program, that was a great honor for Emory University. Certainly, a program like this, is, its aim is not only to impart modern science education for the Tibetan monks and nuns, but His Holiness's vision here is to prepare the future contemplative collaborators with the science so that new knowledge can be formed uh, which can have a tremendous benefit for the humanity at large. And then monk students themselves also gradually, they really found well, not only just interest, but something really useful. 
extensive science curriculum has been created and translated. Many Tibetan monks have been trained over years at Emory University to become science teachers for the project, and new science centers had been created at all of the leading Tibetan monasteries in India. For the first time in 2,000 years, a dramatic change has been made in Tibetan monastic education. Science has officially become a required course of study. And we can implement knowledge from Buddhist science and Buddhist philosophy, then we can create a collaboration of a knowledge which can have a very positive outcome. Although the outcome may not appear immediately, in the long run, there will be great results and uh, great uh, progress. And I see it as a contribution to uh, the future generations and uh, uh, humanity as a whole. The Dalai Lama also encouraged the development of new scientifically-based education curriculum for youth. A conference was held in 2018 for the presentation of some model programs. And so your office extended an invitation to individuals around the world to think about building curricula that have an ethical dimension to them. Mm -hmm. And this is where Jennifer Knox and her colleagues in the group at Emory have been doing some really fundamental work. And their program is called the SEE program, Social, Emotional, and Ethical Learning. Three focuses of inner focus and emotional intelligence, other focus, social intelligence, and outer focus, systems intelligence. Many individuals who are in our culture have experienced trauma. And so without um, developing some fundamental skills of regulating the nervous system, the students are not often able to even move into a meditation. And the breath can often be a trigger for that former trauma. So we've built in an entire chapter based on building skills of, of resilience. Scientifically based on the breakthroughs that have been made in the fields of cognitive science, epigenetics, and neuroscience over the past 30 years, the C program teaches effective coping skills, strategies that can be used to regulate emotion, and strategies to gain focus. Now the modern knowledge, education, not adequate to bring happy society, we create some problem disagreement, uh, then the uh, solution, uh, we put the responsibility of the solution on gun. Totally wrong. The C program has been translated into 12 different languages. And in April of 2019, the Dalai Lama launched the program worldwide. This is our 30th dialogue. 30 occasions where we have sat with His Holiness, scientists, philosophers, scholars, and contemplatives, investigating the relationship between Buddhist science <laughs> and modern science. We also want to acknowledge your dear friend, Francisco Varela, whose vision made it possible in a very powerful way for all of us to be together and to uh, greet Amy Varela. Where are you, Amy? Who is president of the board of Mind and Life Europe. Creating bridges through dialogue is not a quick and straightforward process. To participate in a true dialogue you must bring to it the whole of yourself. You must expect that building a bridge may be slow, difficult, even threatening at times. Its essence is in its dynamical and open nature, which is a necessary condition for something really new to emerge from it. And the active ingredient in the production of something radically new is personal commitment absolute presence through compassion and friendship. Gentle bridges, the true dialogue between the Western and the Buddhist traditions for investigating the nature of reality. 
the Dalai Lama continued to push for the expansion of dialogue with other scientists from many other parts of the world, from Africa to Japan, with Russian scientists and with Chinese scientists. Now we are going to have one meeting with Chinese scientists. This is the first time. So there is real potential. Yes. Now here we are a few people, but we are representing billions of people. Okay. Yeah. And that, not academic, but the world passing through some kind of crisis of emotion. That emotion will not go, go away by prayer. But training our mind in order to train our mind, we should have fuller knowledge about the whole system of our emotion and mind. We will certainly hmm? welcome you hmm. in Taiwan and we will initiate hmm? a continual discussion in Taiwan sometime. Thank you. On his 80th birthday, the Dalai Lama publicly reaffirmed his commitment to stand shoulder to shoulder with scientists as they tackle the toughest issues facing humanity. I'm a simple Buddhist monk, but at the same time, uh, eventually I become very close with scientists. In our training, reason become very important. So this scientific way, it compels us. Now think how to utilize the findings, translate into action. New ideas, new way. Scientists really show you. I think genuine interest try to make a better world. But this is the sign of our progress. So therefore, remain a little bit skeptical. Then skepticism brings doubt. Doubt brings investigation. Buddha stated, all oh, my follower, monks, scholars, should not accept my teaching out of faith, out of devotion, but rather thorough investigation and experiment. Through that way, once you convince, then you accept my teaching. So this quite sort of scientific way. So therefore, uh, my body, this, this person, half Buddhist monk, half scientist. <laughs> <laughs>